I read this report recently um, that in 2020, since 2016, only four sedition cases have seen a conviction in a court of law. Um, so as, you, as you're saying, many of, this, uh, many of this charging is basically uh, frivolous in nature. Um, so is, is, it, is it because the state is charging people frivolously that they don't see a conviction in the court? Um, or is it lack of evidence? How do you sort of explain uh, the very few uh, uh, convictions in, in a court of law? I actually uh, believe that the privility of charges uh, represents only a minority of cases. In most cases, the charge is an intended use of law. So uh, the IS, so it's not that, uh, you know, the police went after these boys wearing ISIS t-shirt because the police wanted to prosecute the boys. The police wanted to send across a message that wearing ISI is anti-national. Uh, the boys happen to be, you know, inadvertent about it. But then there are a lot of people who are not. So if there is a if there is a court uh, on Facebook saying I support Pakistan, it may not be an inadvertent act. The question is whether saying I support Pakistan means that you are inciting violence against your own government. Now that's not what the law says. Or, or, you know, I remember the case of that, um, of, of the actress oh, yeah. Ramya, yeah. Ramya who'd come back from Pakistan after a SARC summit and said Pakistan is not hell and the people are actually really nice and there was a case of sedition file against her. So if, if, so in the, what, what's happening in the use of law in the executive domain is that anything that is deviant from what is the accepted nationalist conduct, quote unquote, normative nationalist conduct, invites the charge of sedition. So nationalism no longer is pride in your own country, but nationalism also means that you can't say anything that is praiseworthy of the enemy, the supposed enemy of your country. But I, I understood that part. What I'm trying to get at is that um, um, the very few uh, charges have seen conviction in the court. Uh, how do you explain that? So um, one that um, the pendency um, percentage of court disposal of cases is very high. So every year there's almost 80 to 90 percent pendency rate of FIRs filed. So it's not that most across cases. All cases. Across, across all cases. cases. So it's not that out of say 70. So um, in 2018, 70 cases of FIR. 70 uh, um, FIRs of file on sedition. Um, but the total number of cases that were taken up for trial were only 13. Now, out of 13, 11 resulted in acquittal and 2 resulted in conviction. Now, that 11 versus 2 ratio also goes on to say a lot. But what is still absent is that out of these many cases, only 11 were cases where trial was completed. So it's the process that's the punishment more so. So falling rate of conviction on the one hand, of course, says that these are uh, charges that deviate from the established understanding of law and hence are unsustainable in court. And of course, that's a very, very dominant argument that these are unsustainable charges that are being leveled at the level. At, at the but, but this also, this I understand, this also means that the judiciary uh, is cognizant of the fact that much of what goes on in the name of sedition um, or much of what the government does in the name of sedition is unsustainable. The judiciary is cognizant of that fact. That needs to be... Uh, yes. I mean, right. Um, yes. You do but, talk about... So go ahead. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't think that courts take a position that just because a law is... That law should be uh, read down or, yeah. or you know, declared unconstitutional. Yeah. That's not... Yeah the stand that comes from the official discourse. Yeah, so sure. the misuse of the law is not enough a reason for the judiciary to sort of relook at it. Right. Um, you know, you also, um, uh, and you mentioned this um, early in one of your answers, um, you, you, you sort of term sedition is an exercise um, in imposing normative nationalisms. Uh, you do, you'd sort of uh, alluded to that earlier on. Do you want to explain that a little more? So, um, I, I would want to approach this question from, again, the kind of example that I was citing. So um, if cheering for the victory of the Pakistan team um, 
invites the charge of sedition or um, saying i support pakistan or or liking a particular facebook post which supports the the neighboring country etc invites the charge of sedition then what is happening is that <clears throat> an entire discourse of majoritarian nationalism is being constructed where the conduct so what would be a national uh, uh, act and an anti national act are very very clearly laid down and any deviation from what is popularly constructed as national invites the charge of sedition and uh, it's only the adherence to and the majoritarian discourse of nationalism is what i call the normative discourse of nationalism because it's become the norm you have to conform to what is nationalism in accordance with that that majority in, uh, within the contours of that majoritarian discourse so that's become the the driving point of the use of the law and um, again so to speak the national icons are very very important in this particular discourse so whether it's the national anthem or the national flag or or uh, the national emblem so not standing up for the national anthem invites the charge of sedition even though if at all it should be a concern the supreme court's come down heavily on it after its earlier guideline but if at all it should be a concern of law it should be a concern of the national honor act and not the law of sedition but uh, unfortunately most of the cases of sedition today relate to uh, offenses against these quote and quote national symbols so the driving point of na the discourse of nationalism are these national symbols but what is very interesting and what gets often left out in in the entire debate is that all of this is happening to invoke a particular law that was meant to be an offense against the government so what is right. happening is that a law which was meant to be an offense against the government is being used against anything that is anti national and the conflation by by default is then between the government and the nation so government right. becomes the nation so anything that is sedition becomes anti national um, i'm trying to understand um, uh, the relationship between various anti terror laws such as uapa um, and 124a which is a sedition law um, uh, because i mean I, i'm i'm quite unclear about it uh, there's a lot going on about um, you know um, sedition anti national um etc and there is also a lot going on in the name of uh, terrorism and in the public imagination uh, you know people look at someone who is accused of sedition as a as an anti national as a terrorist um, you know desh drohi etc etc so is there a, from a, from a technical legal point of view is there a relationship between 124a and uh, upa and and and, and other uh, anti terror laws such as such as the upa okay so um, there are two particular patterns that um the alignment of 124a with anti terror laws follow one is um the conjoined use of both laws in the same case so in a uapa case 124a would also be used as an adjunct charge which then of course then diffuses the meaning of sedition because it's now associated with the terror case and second is um uh provisions of anti terror laws reproducing um offenses that can also be ordinarily charged under the uh, under 124a so uapa for instance penalizes disaffection against the government under section 20 that's also the offense of sedition but uapa mm. gives a wider reach because it's not aligned to a clause of incitement to violence now right. Uh, right. in my work i've seen three kinds of patterns of the of the relationship between uh, anti terror laws and sedition one that the use of anti terror law may completely obliterate the possibility of invoking 124a in a particular case because uapa would help the state achieve a lot more than what sedition would because you know it gives you wider power it gives wider power to police it dilutes safeguards of crpc in courts etc second is that uapa has a provision of enhancing punishment if the accused is found flouting rules under other um, sections as well so if uapa is used along with 124a then the enhanced pen the provision for enhancing penalty sort of increases and a lot of times um, 
the charge of literature in a tether case invites the uh, the the offense of sedition and the larger conspiracy charge invites the uapa uh, the third is that uapa may not be invoked directly in the primary um, uh, framing of the particular case so sedition may be a primary charge and later on with investigation uapa is invoked because the police goes on to find out that you know there's a larger conspiracy at work etc so sedition then is used as a base charge now this is something that has happened before uapa the amendment to uapa in 2004 with regard to other anti terror laws also so for instance um, when tada was being used against the khalistan movement um, predominantly the <clears throat> the supporters of the khalistani movement for sloganeering or carrying out processions for even you know listening to cassettes uh, which had recordings of bindranwale etc but charged under tada and the particular section which dealt with expression invited the charge of sedition so there are there are cases i remember very clearly balbir singh versus state of up where the person was charged under tada section 4 plus sedition because that person was caught listening to the cassettes of bindranwale and the supreme court had come down heavily against the police saying that listening to something doesn't mean performance of that particular expression so it's not a sustainable charge so that particular use of sedition we've seen in context of tada in context of quota again um quota plus sedition against semi activists against all other uh, cases where the primary charge was that of jihadi terror where speeches of particular organizations who were banned or or who were or or a ban was being contemplated on these organizations invited the charge of sedition so whatever literature they published invited the charge of sedition and the larger conspiracy invited the charge of quota so that's the kind of conjoined use that one has witnessed and right. which in effect has of course led to a dilution of what sedition means because it has no individual character in these cases it becomes just right. a follow up charge uh, within right. terror right you know those who support um, um, laws like the sedition law would argue that india is a country that faces multiple challenges both internal and external from nationalism to um um uh, you know insurgency to terrorism and there have been multiple terror attacks um in india uh, both in kashmir and um, uh, in other in other parts of india uh, mumbai delhi etc so we need stringent laws of this kind um because we are still struggling to deal with some of these some of these very very major challenges what would be your response to that um uh, would you say that you can deal with these uh, issues using other laws or uh, and we don't need sedition what would be your your answer to this kind of a, a counter to um, uh, or or support to sedition law as it were so these are exactly the kind of arguments that were used in constituent assembly um, for the retention of the law of sedition and uh, the the belief was that a democratic country unlike the colonial uh, state would not misuse a provision mm. and would only target the the reactionaries the so called the enemies of the state the internal enemies of the state um what is completely missing the debate is the is the aspect of uh, control that political authorities have over offenses that are defined as offenses against the state so sedition is a law which is uh, uh, giving political authorities the power to prosecute any expression that they think is seditious in nature because mm. the interpretation of what is seditious at least in at the level of invoking the particular section is with the executive and it's also an offense against the executive because it's defined as an offense against the government and both government of course in political science we sort of relate government to executive judiciary comes much later into the scene when it comes to the interpretation of whether or not the fir was sustainable or the charge sheet sustainable or not the charges so judiciary is coming much later it's the executive that has the power to use the law and it's also the executive that has the power to decide who should it use against and 
it's also the executive that becomes the victim of the law unlike other criminal offenses where it's not the executive that's the primary victim of the law even in a case of murder state is the is, is the plaintiff but not directly the victim but here it is so once the government or the executive is willing to assume that kind of victimhood from say a seditious expression the charge of 124a is invoked into that scene so what is completely missing the debate is the kind of power that laws like sedition are giving to the executive where in a democratic setup people's representatives have the power to use a particular law against the people who have made them people's representative so that aspect distinguishes sedition from other laws that uh, that are laws meant to coagulate the national security so sedition is really just about mere expressions against the government so so put, put differently would you say that uh, in order to deal with the other contingencies of national security there are there are enough um, laws that are in existence you don't need a law like sedition is that the argument i'd like to believe so because eventually what a law like sedition would do is continue to empower the state government to penalize expressions that uh, it wouldn't want to hear that's in effect what the law achieves incitement to violence is different incitement yeah. to violence also in a in a more qualified jurisprudence would mean really an offense that that uh, preempts physical act of violence which is not what sedition does sedition originally is just about a certain kind of um uh, really uh, deep criticism of the government Dr. Singh, wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.